My name is Mike McGuire. Today I'm going to talk to you about how adding a chemical, chlorine, to drinking water changed public health in this country. And really the purpose of the presentation is to talk about how the addition of this chemical, this treatment process, really changed everything with respect to the health of children. We were killing children by the hundreds of thousands at the turn of the century due to contaminated water. And Dr. John Leal, who was the subject of this presentation, made it happen to stop all of those problems. Besides the history of chlorine, I'm interested in what drives a person to greatness. Now we'll never know what was driving Dr. John Leal with respect to his decision to put chlorine in the water. But we do know that his father became ill as a regimental surgeon in the Civil War at the siege of Charleston, South Carolina. He and a thousand men in the regiment came down with a waterborne disease. And that waterborne disease was undoubtedly amoebic dysentery, which is a terrible disease. And at that time, there were three outcomes. The first, you died immediately. The second possibility was your body fought it off. And the third possibility is that it became a chronic disease until ultimately it killed you. And that's what happened to Dr. John Rose Leal, who was the father of the main person in this presentation. And Dr. John Rose Leal suffered from this disease, which was carried by contaminated water. And his son saw the suffering and undoubtedly affected his decision to become a water quality expert when he finished his medical practice. Now I'm going to talk about germs, disease, and death, which are my favorite topics. And I'd like you to join me in uh, strapping yourself into your favorite time machine. Let's go back to the 1890s when things were really different. Waterborne disease and death from waterborne disease were accepted facts of life at the turn of the 20th century and earlier in the 1890s. Cities were exploding. The Industrial Revolution in this country was in full swing. Migrants were coming in to staff the factories, and the populations of these cities were becoming really large. And they had to get the waste from these people out of the city because of the miasma theory of disease. And under that miasma theory, bad smells caused disease. The importance then of getting the filth out of the city as quickly as possible was solved by the construction of centralized sewer systems. And those sewer systems sent the water to usually the closest stream or lake or river. And the receiving stream, unfortunately, was usually the water supply for somebody else. At the same time these centralized sewers were being constructed, centralized water distribution systems were being built not for providing water to people's homes, but for fighting fires. In the 1800s, we were burning down cities with great regularity. Most people have heard of the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. So the laying of pipes in the streets to provide pressurized water to fight fires gave the utility the opportunity to serve water directly to houses from the same system with no treatment, coming from contaminated supplies, to use it to facilitate the operation of this newfangled gadget called the flush toilet. And so sanitary engineers created an efficient delivery of disease and death. Centralized sewer systems depositing uh, sewage into the local stream, which was then the water supply, which was served to people. I call this the sewer pipe, water pipe uh, death spiral. And it was something that happened in the industrialized rivers of the east coast of the United States, where at the top the water was pure, it was withdrawn, the sewage was put back into the river, and so on down the river for many cities until the water could not be used because it was so contaminated. There was one early disinfection example that I'm going to cover uh, that happened in Lincoln, England, there were a couple of other, other examples of the use of disinfectants uh, in European water supplies on a very small scale. But uh, this one in Lincoln, England is important because Dr. Leal was aware of it and used it in both the trial that I'm going to talk about and in the practice of disinfection. 
So uh, let's talk about it a second. In January 1905, there was a typhoid fever ep epidemic in the city. Uh, hundreds of people got sick, 125 people died. The difference with this particular example is that there was treatment on the water supply, a slow sand filter. But that slow sand filter was not being operated properly and the typhoid bacilli were just going straight through the filter and into the pipes. The city hired Dr. Houston, who came in and thought it would be a good idea to try to put in something called sodium hypochlorite, which is chlorine, with a drip uh, function providing about one part per million of dose to the water supply, and it worked. The uh, epidemic uh, ended, and they continued to use this method of treatment for a number of years afterwards. The profession of sanitary engineering was interested in chemical disinfectants. They knew they would work. People had done research for decades on the application of a variety of disinfectants to drinking water, but it was the public who was not interested in having uh, chemicals in their water. And the professionals reflected this, this uh, concern by the public. And so uh, when papers were presented, in this case uh, by Professor George Whipple at a, an AWWA conference in uh, 1906, just the discussion of the possibility of adding chlorine to water was very controversial. Even uh, Professor Whipple did not promote the use of chlorine. He was just discussing the possibility of its use. But nonetheless, he was attacked by the audience. Uh, the, audi the people in the audience knew that this was a very risky proposition because of the public's view on chemicals in water. Uh, Professor Mason, uh, who was a future president of the American Water Works Association, uh, stood up and essentially disagreed with the presentation and said, not now, maybe in the future. And by the way, we know about these words because there was a court reporter in the room uh, when this presentation was made who took down uh, all of the comments. And I'm particularly uh, intrigued by the comment by Mr. Magnan. All these substances, including chlorine, are poisonous. Such poisonous materials should not be permitted to be used on water intended for public supplies. This was the prevailing theory at the time. But enter Dr. John Leal. Dr. Leal was born in a small town in New York State. His father served, as I said, in the Civil War as a regimental surgeon. In 1867, the family left the small town and moved to Patterson, New Jersey, which was one of these exploding towns uh, in America at the time. It was highly industrialized and the population growth was tremendous. A good place to set up a medical practice for Dr. John Rose Leal. Dr. John L. Leal uh, attended Princeton College and the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. He must have been a pretty smart guy. Uh, got his MD degree in 1884. And as I mentioned, his father died uh, peritonitis caused by amoebic dysentery in 1882. Dr. Leal, after getting his medical education, moved back to Patterson, New Jersey and established a medical practice. It was associated with the local hospitals, but he started to move into the public health arena by taking positions in city government. And he became the public health officer for the city of Patterson in 1892. And he was that public health officer until 1899, shortly before the turn of the century. And in that role, he saw all manner of problems with contaminated drinking water. He went through two horrific typhoid fever epidemics. So he knew what it was like to deal with people who were dying from contaminated water. Jersey City, New Jersey, and its water supply is a major part of the story. Jersey City started out as a small village, had shallow urban wells which became contaminated. They moved the wells outside the city and as the city grew they became contaminated and so on until in 1854 they built an eight mile long pipeline to what they thought was going to be an inexhaustible supply of pure water. 
Uh, that turned out to be the Passaic River at Bellevue, New Jersey, which unfortunately was downstream of Patterson, New Jersey, which as I said, was an, an exploding town with lots of waste coming into that water supply. And by 1895, the typhoid fever death rate was horrific, 80 per 100,000, which is something that would certainly never be tolerated today. The Jersey City, New Jersey government knew that they had to find a better water supply. They found a temporary one in 1895, but they really wanted a brand new permanent water supply, and so they advertised for a contractor to develop it. And a person by the name of Patrick H. Flynn, who today we would call an entrepreneur, maybe a crook, uh, got the contract. Uh, no experience in creating water supplies, but he was able to get the contract. Uh, and he started to build this reservoir, Booten Reservoir, and Booten Dam, and a pipeline to the city and provide water under the contract that had to be pure and wholesome. That's a very important term of art because pure and wholesome was included in contracts in England, was part of English common law, and was used in the United States uh, in water contracts, but was never enforced to the degree that it was in this case. The contract was assigned to a private water company called the Jersey City Water Supply Company because Patrick Flynn went bankrupt. Dr. John Leal worked for the Jersey Water Supply Company, and part of his job was going up into the watershed and removing points of contamination. This watershed, which was on the Rockaway River, was generally unpopulated except for a few small towns and cities. And those, of course, were putting their waste into the, into the river, but the real problem was the uh, use in the watershed of privies that were built out over streams and tributaries that discharged their contents directly to the water. This was not unusual at the turn of the 20th century in the United States, and it's found today in some developing countries. So he had already been working on water pollution in the water supply of this, uh, this place, Booton, New Jersey. The water supply was completed in 1904, and water began to be delivered to the city. So the contract called for Jersey City to provide 7.6 million dollars of uh, money at that time to uh, the successful contractor, the Jersey City Water Supply Company. 7.6 million dollars doesn't sound like a lot, but of course that was in 1904 dollars. Today that's approximately 175 million dollars, a significant amount of money, and when the water supply was finished, Jersey City decided that they didn't want to pay the full amount. This resulted obviously in a lawsuit. Uh, the reason why the lawsuit uh, really started was because if Jersey City could find a way to get the contract price reduced, then they wouldn't have to pay as much. They hired a consultant, again, Professor Whipple, to look at the quality of the water being delivered from the Booten Reservoir. And he used the two new um, technologies that were being developed at the time. Bacteriology was just becoming a science at this time. There was a rudimentary technique for a total plate count, and they were using a precursor of the technique we now call total coliforms. He applied those to the water supply, and no surprise, he found bacteria, and found in some cases, a lot of bacteria. Jersey City sued the Jersey City Water Supply Company. And in that lawsuit, they were focused on the language that was in that contract of providing a pure and wholesome supply. They claimed that the company was not doing that. There was a trial. There were 3,000 pages of testimony, experts on both sides talking about whether or not that supply was safe to drink, it was pure and wholesome, and a judge provided a verdict in 1908 that stated generally the water supply was pretty good. 
but two or three times a year there were very high counts of bacteria. And what caused those high counts of bacteria were storm events. Uh, on the slide you can see a graphic of Booten Reservoir. It looks sort of like a, a cucumber. Uh, the water from the Rockaway River comes in at the upper left and it goes out at the dam at the upper right. So during any kind of a rainstorm in the Rockaway watershed, there would be short circuiting across that reservoir and bacteria would definitely be in the water served to the city. And so the purifying work of the reservoir was done imperfectly, as the judge stated. And so there was a final decree that was issued by the judge in this case. And he found that Jersey City had to pay the contractor the $7.6 million, except they could deduct a certain amount of money that would be required to put in sanitary sewers to take the waste out of these small towns in the watershed. So in effect, they got their wish that uh, the water supply uh, would be protected, but they would pay less money. Well, the Jersey City Water Supply Company was not happy with that, and Dr. John Leal got some language put into the final decree, and we know this because of uh, testimony in the second trial. And that language said that other plans or devices could be installed on this water supply and make that water supply pure and wholesome. So they only had a short period of time to do it, but there was this out instead of deducting the money from the contract price. A special master was hired, uh, William Magi, who was a retired Supreme Court Justice for the state of New Jersey. And the efficacy of other plans or devices were the major focus of the second trial. Leal knew that chlorine was the solution. He had experimented with chlorine in low concentrations in the late 1890s, and he knew that it killed typhoid bacilli. After the decree, Leal said, I'm going to make this happen. He decided that the process of sterilization or disinfection was going to be installed as one of the other plans or devices to meet the requirements of the court. And so then he decided to hire the most famous sanitary engineer at the time, George Warren Fuller. George Warren Fuller is a famous person in the water industry. There's an award named after him. Uh, but at the time, in the turn of the 20th century, he was the most famous sanitary engineer then. And Leal hired him to build this chlorination facility, this, this treatment plant that would add chlorine to the water. And he gave him instructions after Fuller agreed to do the job gave him instructions to finish this within 99 days. Fuller took on the project and moved forward implementing chlorine in the water supply. He had one source of chlorine available, and that was something called chloride of lime or bleaching powder. We know it today as calcium hypochlorite. They called it bleaching powder because indeed it was used in laundries to bleach shirts. It was a granular powdery substance that was very difficult to handle if you're trying to feed it into a very high flow of water. And so using this supply, using this only source of chlorine, George Warren Fuller designed a treatment system to add chlorine to the water in low concentrations, about 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams per liter, but at a very high flow rate. 40 million gallons per day. Nothing had been done on this scale in Europe, in the United States, anywhere in the world. Fortunately, Fuller had some experience in designing a feed system for this kind of material. He designed something similar for feeding aluminum sulfate in a filtration plant that he designed in 1904. And so the facility was built within 99 days. It was housed next to the gatehouse at Booten Dam. You can see Booten Dam going from left to right. And in the center of the photo 
is the gatehouse where all the valves were to close and open pipes uh, below that were coming from Booton Reservoir. The sterilization house, as they called it, was a wood frame structure that unfortunately has since been demolished. And all of the equipment to feed chlorine to the water was housed in that structure. And the project was completed on September 26, 1908. Chlorine began its feed there and it has been fed in Jersey City ever since. Jersey City has the longest period of record for disinfection of their water supply for any city in the world. The second trial found that indeed chlorine was safe, effective, and met the test of other plans or devices. And so chlorine from uh, Judge Magi was indeed approved. Most importantly, the New Jersey Supreme Court in 1910 sustained the special master's findings. And as a result of this stamp of approval by a high court in one of the states, chlorine use exploded across the United States. Sanitary engineers were getting pretty sick and tired of all of the contaminated water and death and, and problems that was being caused by it. And they were looking for a solution, but no one had the courage to put a chemical disinfectant into the water. No one except Dr. John Leal. And as a result of the application of chlorine to drinking water, typhoid fever was conquered in this country. The decrease that you see in the death rate uh, from typhoid fever was dramatic. And it really uh, showed the rapid installation of chlorine in the United States. By 1914, 21 million people were being served chlorinated water. And just four years later, 33 million people were being served chlorinated water. This was almost three quarters of the people being served municipal water in this country. Life magazine called filtration and chlorination of public water as the probably the most significant public health advance of the millennium. Not of the decade, not of the century, but the millennium. But I think what water professionals should be most proud of is the reduction in the death rate of children that are less than one year of age. The death rate in this country at the turn of the 20th century was horrific, mostly due to diarrheal disease, mostly due to contaminated water and milk. In some cities, the death rate was 20 to 30 percent. And think about that for a second. One in five to one in three children died before the age of one year because of contaminated water uh, and other problems, mostly contaminated water. But chlorination and the improvement of the, the milk supply, as you can see from the slide, dramatically decreased the death rate for young children. And as a result, we began to live longer. In 1900, the average life expectancy was 47 years. Now it's about 79 years. It is the result of the chlorination of drinking water that we do, in fact, live longer. And we have, begun, we have been living longer since the turn of the century, since 1908. Scientific American in 2007 called chlorination one of the great inventions of the 20th century. And I like to say that if you have lived past the age of 47 years, don't thank a doctor, thank an engineer. I became interested in the family of Dr. John Leal and I was curious about where he was buried. And I did not know there were no records that I could find. I went to the largest cemetery in uh, Patterson, New Jersey. And I went up to the desk and asked if a John Leal was buried. And indeed, he was. There was a family plot. Uh, the guy behind the counter gave me a map, showed me how to get there. I drove up to the top of the hill and went to the place where the graves were and found a bare piece of ground. There was no headstone, no monument, nothing that showed that Dr. John Leal, the person who instituted chlorine in drinking water in this, in this country, was not remembered. And I didn't think that was right. I worked with the New Jersey American Water Works section and the descendants of Dr. John Leal, uh, his two great-grandsons, 
to erect a monument in his honor at his gravesite in Patterson, New Jersey. The monument mentions all of the people and the family that are buried there, but also it mentions that John Leal was a hero of public health, and indeed he was. We had a dedication ceremony in 2013, and in, at that dedication ceremony, his two great grandsons came and helped us dedicate the monument. I'm convinced that the chlorination of drinking water for Jersey City could only have happened because of both men who were involved in its completion. George Warren Fuller had the technical expertise to build a chemical delivery system, a chlorine delivery system, that would work. Dr. John Leal had the courage and the vision to make it happen. Fuller would never have done this on his own. Engineers at this time were way too conservative. Dr. John Leal, as a public health expert and a physician, knew that something had to be done. He knew that local concentrations of chlorine would make it happen, and he had the courage to install it and make sure that through the trial it was approved. And the amazing thing is that it worked flawlessly from the beginning, and as a result, it was protecting the citizens of Jersey City. And I wrote a book about it. Uh, this book really does honor the legacy of Dr. John Leal. Uh, it's something that I enjoy doing to, to find this uh, forgotten hero of public health. Um, someone took credit for his vision and courage. It's one of the reasons why nobody has heard, from, heard of him. And so now, uh, by writing this book, and getting it out into the world, I hope that everyone will appreciate the incredible contribution of Dr. John Leal to providing chlorination to drinking water and revolutionizing public health in the United States. Thank you.